evening, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Jerry, thank you for that introduction and for your speech. Um, I was getting a little uh, emotional when she was introducing me, and part of this is, um, you know, things go first full circle in life. I started working, um, well, first of all, let me um, just say a couple uh, words of thanks. So uh, the mayor had to leave, but thank you to the mayor. Uh, thank you to other elected officials who are here today. Uh, John, Monica, Joanne, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. D.A. Sullivan, uh, for your um, spearheading efforts around criminal justice reform uh, is uh, incredibly important uh, work. To other folks, Jeff, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to be here. It's a really special place uh, for me. Um, I also want to give a particular shout out to my former staff at uh, BSAS. Uh, who are here, Erica Piedad and Ruth Jacobs and Hardy, who I think you know are incredible. Um, I, I, I will tell you that you probably you, you will never have a better advocate for services here in Western Massachusetts than Ruth Jacobs and Hardy. And I remember um, <laughs> you know we were fortunate when we were at the bureau because we actually did get significant new dollars to help in this. And you know Ruth would be there all the time talking about where is a fair share for Western Massachusetts and that Massachusetts doesn't end at Springfield. Um, so it's really important and to other folks, Deb Berkovitz, who I've known for a very long time. So I just want to thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. But, but it is pretty significant for me to be here. I was thinking, um, I spent, uh, I thought I was going to work for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health for maybe a year or two. Uh, and I ended up staying there almost 18 years. And my first job at BSAS, uh, I was a program manager and I was the HIV coordinator. Um, and uh, BSAS um, had uh, some federal dollars to provide uh, HIV uh, outreach services. Annie's here, she probably remembers this. Uh, provide um, uh, outreach services to out of treatment injection drug users as a way to get them into care. And Tapestry Health Systems had the contract, and Tim Purrington was the contract manager. I don't think I ever heard their words harm reduction before I met Tim. Uh, so, um, so it's really a special place for me. So I spent a lot of my early time out here uh, and throughout the course of my time at DPH. So it really feels special for me to be, as I've come back to Massachusetts, to uh, uh, come to uh, Northampton and Western Mass again. So um, I, what, what I thought I'd do is just spend a, a little bit of time uh, kind of talking about um, the, what we tried to accomplish with the Obama administration. I think some of the challenges uh, that we're presented with right now, and, and I think um, where, where we need to go next with this issue. Um, so, so one is, and uh, John talked about a paradigm shift, and you know, w one of the things that we really tried to do with drug policy um, at, with the Obama administration is, is really shift our approach to one based on arrest and incarceration uh, and supply reduction to one that was based on public health. Our office was actually started in 1988 um, and really tasked with formulating the administration's drug policy, but we also had a really unique function in that we looked at the, what each agency was spending and tasked each agency spending around how we were going to approach issues of drug use. And throughout the history of our office, those supply reduction strategies, you know, eradicating heroin in Mexico, and I'm not saying these are not important, but the overwhelming dollars that the federal government spent were always tilted uh, toward uh, 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 eradication interdiction efforts. And very little, quite honestly, was spent on uh, public health funds, prevention, treatment, recovery support. And, you know, and I have to say things have changed uh, under President Trump's new budget. But when we left the administration, it was the first time in the history of our office that we were actually spending equal amounts on both supply reduction and public health strategies. And I think that's really important. <laughs> And, and I also think we were able to make significant progress around criminal justice reform, both at the national level, state, and local level. Um, but, but I want to talk about our approach to this epidemic. Um, many of those things talked about here, and then uh, I'd also like to kind of open it up to kind of questions and comments. So, so first and foremost, you know, we know prevention is the key, and I think that, uh, you know, both in terms of this epidemic and substance use uh, issues in general, you know, we need to make sure 
that uh, we have vibrant community-based prevention programs. You know, a former speaker of the House of Massachusetts used to talk about all politics is local, and I always used to say that all prevention is local. So what th issues look like here in Northampton is different from what it looks like in Worcester and Boston. And so part of our efforts were to continue to support. And, and I think uh, many of you are here uh, that are, have been recipients of drug-free community grant programs through our office. And uh, we're actually glad um, that President Trump decided uh, not to eliminate those grants um, and uh, uh, understood the value of those dollars. But particularly in the opiate epidemic, we knew that we had a, a, a significant overprescribing issue. And Joanne, I really want to thank you for your efforts. We're doing the same thing at Boston Medical Center. Um, and, and part of this is, you know, and I think you've seen data that, uh, you know, we, we are prescribing enough pain medication to give every adult American their own bottle of pain pills. Right, and so, you know, yes, we want pain treated. Sometimes they don't need to be treated with an opioid. Uh, sometimes we have things like physical therapy and acupuncture and massage that will do quite well. Uh, you know, we were talking about surgery. I saw a study out of Dartmouth-Hitchcock that looked at the top five outpatient surgeries and uh, where people got prescription for opioids. And what they found is that quite honestly, uh, when they went back and they polled people about how much they took, they found out that the vast majority of them uh, took one or two or three days worth of prescriptions, right? And so you know what happens uh, after that. We, as uh, good consumers of healthcare, you know, uh, we take our prescriptions, things that we don't use, and we stick them in a medicine cabinet for a rainy day, and we know that that's uh, where it gets diverted. So part of what we did, we worked with the DEA, and I know many of you did this at the local level, of sponsoring drug take back days. Uh, and that's been wildly successful in terms of both educating the community around prescription drugs, but also promoting safe and effective storage and disposal uh, uh, opportunities. We worked with the DEA to establish new regulations so that you wouldn't have to wait until drug take back days. And I think many of you have been partnering with local pharmacies and others to s establish uh, uh, kiosks uh, within pharmacies to be able to give them back uh, on, on a daily basis. So, but fundamentally, we really focused on treatment. So, you know, we were talking about other diseases. So here in the United States, um, uh, only about 10 to 14% of people who reach diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder get treatment. Think about that, 14%. So substance use disorders has roughly the same prevalence as diabetes, right? Um, but about 85% of people with diabetes are getting treatment. And why? Why is that? Well, one, we're doing a good job at early intervention. Right, so at every step along the way, particularly if you have a family history of diabetes, we're doing a better job at detection and monitoring and intervening people before they reach their acute stage. We don't do that with addiction. So, um, you know, part of what we try to promote is better screening and brief intervention for those folks. But really fundamentally expanding treatment. And I have to say, and I think, you know, here's where we have, are very fortunate to uh, be in Massachusetts. Um, where we have had pretty significant healthcare coverage, where our Medicaid program has been very generous in terms of, but that's not the case uh, around the country. And you know, one of the things that was particularly important is the role that the Affordable Care Act played in expanding coverage to people around the country. Um, by one, providing them comprehensive coverage, ensuring that there was a substance use disorder treatment benefit and Medicaid expansion plans, um, but also ensuring that those were offered on par with other health conditions uh, by making sure that insurance companies, both public and private, met parity. So in the United States now, we have what I call treatment deserts. We have 40% of counties in the United States that don't have an, an outpatient program that takes Medicaid. We know, quite honestly, that we don't have enough buprenorphine trained doctors. So of the 900,000 physicians in the United States, only a little over 30,000 have been wavered to treat people with buprenorphine. And we know that even a lower number than that actually prescribe, and of those that prescribe, they're prescribing in very, very low numbers. So, so one of the things that we did is work with Congress to allow nurse practitioners and physician assistants to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. We worked to integrate buprenorphine and medication-assisted treatment into community health centers around the country, something that's already happened here in Massachusetts. We put out $100 million in grants to community health centers to be able to do that. Um, we also worked with the American Medical Association and others to, for their commitment to uh, uh, train an additional 60,000 physicians over the next five years to be able to uh, uh, administer uh, buprenorphine. So, you know, we know we have a long way to go. 
Um, but you know, I, I want to talk about a, a couple things. And you know, I've been in recovery, and you know, one of the things that I think is particularly challenging is the way that we view medication-assisted treatment. Um, and for too long, um, I think we've heard this divisiveness around medication-assisted treatment. Some of it coming from the recovery community themselves, that people who are on these medications who are not in recovery. And the, you know, part of the evidence is clear. Like, you know, we learned a long time ago that the world was not flat, right? And we changed our opinion. And it's time to change our opinion. All the evidence is clear that people on medication-assisted treatment, when they get support in the community, behavioral health supports, do better than treatment without, right? So one of the things, Eric is here, we actually changed our licensing regulations to say if you are a treatment program in Massachusetts, you cannot deny people access to medication-assisted treatment. Right? So it's really important to do that. We change language at the federal level to say if you are a drug court and you get federal money, you cannot kick people off of medication and you can't deny, you can't predicate their participation in drug courts on, if people are on medication. So it's time for the divisiveness to end. The evidence is really clear. So the other piece, and again, you know, I come back to um, uh, uh, Western Massachusetts in terms of the work that we're doing is um, pr promoting people in recovery. And I think, you know, all of you know, uh, and I've been pretty public about my own recovery, um, but I, I'm one of an estimated 20 million people in the United States who are in recovery. And quite honestly, for too long, we've been too silent. Um, we've been, you know, um, you know we've, we felt the shame and the stigma attached to it and been afraid to come out. Sometimes we've been members of 12-step programs and, and we've confused anonymity with uh, being an advocate. And so, just so you know, the, the founders of AA were the biggest champions and biggest vocal proponents of recovery. So anonymity and recovery and advocacy go hand in hand and it's part of the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step groups. So, but, but it really is important that we have a vibrant and vocal recovery community for one, a couple reasons, you know, and this is where Sherry started out. It's about hope, right? And fundamentally, we can have all the treatment capacity that we want, but if people don't see the hope on the other side of addiction, then it's not gonna make a difference. You know, I, I remember very distinctly, you know, when I knew that I had a problem, but I was too afraid to ask for help. I was really afraid what people were going to think of me. You know, I, I, you know, I felt like I looked pretty good. You know, I had a professional job. And I was really concerned with what my employers were going to think, what my family was going to think. And that keeps so many people from asking for help. So you know, a couple things that I think are, are, are really important as we think about how we're going to change that and how we're going to really deal with stigma and, and make, this, uh, make this an issue that uh, uh, people are not ashamed to talk about. Uh, and one, um, and I've met a couple folks here, one is I think that we have seen this tremendous amount of energy with the recovery community and particularly pe young people in recovery who I can't thank enough for your willingness to establish chapters all across the country. We now have recovery support centers. You know, I love driving down the street and seeing a recovery support center next to every other business that we have here. You know, uh, I, w I won't tell you the town, but a town not too far from here um, uh, um, tried to block um, every single treatment program, recovery support program that we wanted to give them, despite the fact that they were one of the most impacted cities in Massachusetts. And, you know, and here's, you know, science and data don't, don't drive public policy. People drive public policy, and that's why we need to be vocal. That's why we need to be uh, um, uh, out there and, uh, and advocate. Uh, many of you I know have for a long time actually worked uh, uh, around issues of HIV and AIDS. Um, and it, it wasn't just this wonderful community that decided, oh, you know, gay men and injection drug users and Haitians have HIV and so we're going to, you know, do everything that we can. That's not how it happened. It was because a lot of gay men and lesbians got really angry and demanded change. You know, and, and I go back to the fact that if this were any other disease, a half a million people have died of drug overdoses since 2000. Think of that, half a million people. And you mean to tell me if this affected any other people um, that, that we would have seen tremendous amount of action uh, a, a long, long time ago. Um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, you know, I think is uh, tremendously important. So one, we need a really uh, vocal 
and active recovery community. That um, in these days where science and data don't uh, appear uh, to be winning the day, think climate change, think immunizations, um, people change. People change opinions when they know someone else. And part of what we need to do is make sure uh, that those of us in recovery, those that have been impacted by us, are doing everything we can uh, to make this uh, a visible issue, to give hope to other people, to see that recovery is possible, to see that you can have a, a vibrant place in the community. You know, you know I, I've often said, if you asked me 28 years ago, I would end up working in, in the White House as President Obama's drug policy advisor. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Um, but, but my story is not unique. You know, I'm one of millions and millions of people who've been restored to productive lives in our community and have used that to give back. Um, but, the, but the other piece I want to talk about, I do, I do want to talk about language. Um, because it's one of the simplest things that we can do to affect change. So, uh, um, uh, Dr. John Kelly, who many of you know works at uh, MGH, uh, runs the Recovery Research Institute, did a really interesting study where he gave two trained, cl trained clinicians, so we're not talking about people on the street, uh, the same uh, scenario. And in one scenario, he talked about a person with a substance use disorder. And in the other one, the only thing he changed was a, a substance abuser. And what he found is even among trained clinicians, when you talk to, to someone as a substance abuser, it was more likely to elicit a punitive response um, as opposed to a therapeutic response. And, and I hear the words that people use all the time. I see what's written in the press when people say junkie and addict. You know, people hear those words. And not only does it keep people from asking for help, but it has a direct impact on how we think about public policy. Johns Hopkins did a study about the stigma of addiction. They found that because of what people think about people with substance use disorders, 44% of Americans didn't, felt like people with substance use disorders were not worthy of a treatment benefit, right? So, you know, and, and if anything kind of shocked me when uh, I came back to Boston, I like rethinking uh, progress. Many of you know Boston Medical Center uh, sits um, uh, at a really interesting intersection in Boston. Uh, it used to be no one went there, and now it's become incredibly gentrified. Um, and as you can imagine, it set off lots of community issues around those people. Um, and I was coming from a meeting, and I was crossing Mass Ave and Albany Street. And we have not only Boston Medical Center, but Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And I was crossing the street, it was a night like tonight, uh, and a truck goes by and the windows are down. And I hear a guy say to the other guy who's riding in the car, we should just line them up and shoot them. And I thought, you know, how, uh, you know, we think we've come far because who we're here, but but we haven't. We have a really long way to go. So, uh, I, and but I'm very happy to say um, that the AP Style Book, which is the journalist handbook of how they talk about things, actually just came out with new language around addiction, right? And it said, don't use words like drunk, uh, uh, drunk and junkie and addict. Um, use words like person with a substance use disorder and addiction. And for those of us in the recovery community, we have a particular challenge. And I always say, don't use your 12-step voice in public settings, right? And so what we call each other in private and in meetings is not the language that we use in public, right? So, you know, if we're on the street, you want to call me a drunk? You're more than happy to do that, but we don't use that language on the outside because it influences how people think about us. So, um, but, but the last thing I'll say, and then we can talk about this, and this has been the theme of the night. Many of you have probably read a book called Dreamland, right? How many people have read Dreamland? Uh, it was written by an author called Sam Quinones, who I've gotten the pleasure to, to um, uh, meet. And it's really about the opioid uh, epidemic. And just the short version, Dreamland was this park and pool complex in Portsmouth, Ohio. And Ohio's been really hard hit, right? And you grew up in Dreamland. You went, they had three pools, and as you got older, you went from one pool to another. You know, and that's where you hang up. That's where families had picnics. You know, and he talks about um, how all of that is gone now. And, and I've heard him speak, and I've had the opportunity to talk, uh, uh, to be uh, um, uh, at conferences where he has spoken. And he uses a phrase that I have often repeated and has been the theme for tonight. And he said, the fundamental solution to our heroin epidemic is community. And I really believe that. I actually believe it's how we work with each other in community. You know, there's been a lot that's written that had been written about, you know, the impact in communities where people haven't gotten jobs. And, and certainly we know the role that poverty uh, plays as it relates to addiction. 
But it's not just about jobs. Jobs give people purpose and meaning in their lives. You know, it's about how they connect with their neighbors, how they connect with their institutions, uh, with their faith institutions. It's how they connect with each other. So, so one of the things I've always liked about this community is um, the, the level, I've always said, Ruth has heard me say this many, many times, everybody knows people here. Everybody knows each other. The relationships that you have here are unique. And that's your strength, that's your re resilience, and that's what you can uh, continue to, to build from. Um, and the other thing that I, I just want to say is that we have some law enforcement folks here uh, who are here today. Um, and, and I've said this many, many times, that um, the way that our federal, state, local law enforcement, our DAs and our criminal justice system have leaned into this issue and have partnered with us on the public health side for comprehensive solutions uh, can't be um, uh, appreciated more. Um, so, you know, and, and all of that started here in Massachusetts. Right? Think about that. Um, you know, the first police force in the country to do naloxone was Quincy, Massachusetts. Now, thousands of police forces are using it. I think many of you know the police assisted recovery initiative started in Gloucester, right? Where police have said, um, you know, we'll come in to treatment, um, come into the police station, we'll give you treatment. Diversion programs that the DA has supported here started here in Massachusetts. So, you know, we have a very, very long history. And, and I do think that, quite honestly, and I've said this before, that if we can't get it right in Massachusetts, nobody's going to get it right. Because we have the best thinkers, we have the most commitment, we have the most resources, we have great community partners to do this. So, you know, I, I, I want to thank you all for the work that you do. Um, you know, when, when I was at the White House, I had to be very careful because I represented the country. And I represented some places in the country that were not as liberal as Massachusetts, if you can believe that. <laughs> so I had to be very, very careful about how many times I promoted things that were happening here in Massachusetts. But, but time and time again, throughout the course of this epidemic, when we were struggling with issues or we wanted to promote innovative programs or we wanted to promote our communities, we kept coming back to the work that was happening here. Um, and so I, I feel very kind of proud and honored to be able to come back to Massachusetts because I, I, I do think, and I'm very, not to be political, I am very, very concerned about the direction that this um, uh, administration is taking as it relates to opiate addiction. So when, we, when you talk about uh, basically um, kicking uh, uh, tens of millions of people off insurance, when you're talking about allowing states to not, not to have to mandate a substance use disorder treatment. When you talk about going back to tough on crime, I, I really worry that, that uh, we are not going to see the support from the federal government that we did in previous administrations. So, so I think it's really incumbent on us on the state and local level to keep this momentum going, to continue to make progress. Uh, while, while we've come very far, all you have to do is to look at the number of deaths that we have here. Uh, in Massachusetts, and I think you all know, you know, the role that fentanyl has played. So, you know, if anything kind of talks about the partnership with our, our criminal justice partners is the fentanyl issue about how do we get this out of our uh, supply, how do we get it out of our communities, how do we make sure that we are getting good uh, um, uh, information out to our people who are using, uh, who are still using to make sure that they understand that they uh, shouldn't use, uh, they shouldn't use alone, always use in the presence of someone who's got naloxone, go slow. Um, I also think, you know, we need to continue to think about innovative approaches. And I know many parts of the state in this country are talking about safe consumption sites, right? And fundamentally, I go back to what Jerry said about, you know, uh, do we value someone's life? And, and, and quite honestly, if saving someone's life uh, is not a noble goal uh, for uh, those programs, then uh, um, you know, but our challenge is they are uh, still against both state law and federal law, and even if we change state law, I'm worried what the federal government's going to do uh, in these kinds of situations. But we need to continue to innovate, we need to continue to do more, we need to continue to come together uh, as a community. Everybody has a role to play, you know, and I think we've seen great support from our banks, from our DA, from our hospital systems, uh, you know, all of us have a role to play. Uh, in this epidemic. So um, I'm really uh, happy to be here. It's nice to be in Northampton again. Um, I hope to uh, continue to be back. Um, we're, we'll continue to work together. The uh, Great Consent Center, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is a um, new center for addiction 
uh, at Boston Medical Center uh, started by an uh, incredibly generous donation from uh, a family who's been affected by this issue. So donated $25 million, the biggest, um, the biggest gift in the hospital's history. Uh, and it's great to see philanthropy finally acknowledging uh, uh, that we need help, that uh, federal government and state government can't do it in, alone, that we need those community partners to do it. So I'm not asking you to donate to Great Kent Center because other folks have already put out that call. So I don't want to take resources away from Northampton and Western Massachusetts. But, but it's really been my uh, honor um, to um, represent you um, nationally and internationally. Um, but also to come back here because I think there is no better place and there are no better people doing this work than the people in this room and the people around the state. So thank you very much.